The holidays will be very merry and bright for your pet with pet care products from TevraPet.com. Every pet deserves to be healthy. At Tevra Pet, we keep pets well from nose to tail. Happy holidays from everyone at Tevra Pet. You've tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today we are speaking with Dr. Kelly Deal. Dr. Kelly Deal left private practice as a small animal internal medicine specialist to join the Morris Animal Foundation, which funds research that benefits animals directly. Dr. Deal will discuss today the Happy Cat, Healthy Cat campaign, which continues to shape protocol around low stress housing and shelters today. Dr. Deal relates some surprising common ground uncovered in a study about bird people versus cat people, and gives us a preview into an ongoing study that looks at the effects of chronic inflammation in feline behavior and cognitive health. Uh, Dr. Deal, Kelly, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thanks, Stacy. It's great to be on. I appreciate you inviting me to speak. So before we jump into all these great topics that we're going to talk about today, first and foremost, how'd you become passionate about cats? I, to the surprise of many people who know me, have always been a cat person. I grew up in a household that we had lots of cats. And that stems to my mom and dad. And my mom had a cat named Mittens when she was a kid. And my dad had a cat named Redzi. And they love these cats. So when I was growing up, and we were in a small house, I think a lot of people can relate. And I got my first cat from my neighbor. If that sounds familiar, I was six years old and she won a race of kittens across the floor. And so I had to take Fluffy home with me. And since that time, I've had probably well over 20 cats. I have three siblings right now. And I think people, again, can relate to we had an old cat who passed away. I had a lot of cats that ended up at the clinic, right? That's how I got cats and with various body parts missing. But when our old cat, last old cat passed away, we went to the local humane society to get more cats. And of course, they knew a sucker when they saw it. And they brought three (laughs) kittens out who are of the same family. And my daughter goes to me, how could we leave anyone behind? Because we really weren't listening, looking for three cats at once. But of course, we have three cats. And that's kind of how I became a cat person. Of course, I saw a lot of cats when I was in practice. We were small animal medicine and probably about almost 50-50 with cats and dogs here in the Denver area. Lots of cat lovers here. And I think that's kind of how I'm still a cat person in many ways. That's interesting that you say 50-50 with regards to the uh, balance in your practice, because isn't it more common to see it be a heavier weight on dogs in private practice versus cats? Yeah, absolutely. I think we, because we were specialty, it was a little, we have a little different population, right? We're drawing from people who are coming to us for a variety of reasons, but we saw a fair, you know, a lot of cats, maybe surprisingly for people who are listening, um, that we did see a lot of cats. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's a good sign. I, I, I would hope and say, I mean, I, I would believe that that number should be growing and maybe one of the reasons why there are additional pressures being felt at the small animal practices with regards to getting access to appointments, to spay, neuter, to services, um, because there are more people maybe looking for services for their cats with the private veterans staying up to date on their you know, visits and their vaccines. And there's just a larger demand out there um, for services. And it seems like there's a shorter number of veterinarians you know, out there um, able to help. You know, do you have any magical solutions to the shortage? Do you believe in this veterinary shortage that's out there? I mean, what, what's your take on what's happening out there? That's a great question. And I think it's multifactorial, but you touch on a couple different topics. One is 
will tackle the veterinary shortage for veterinarians. And I think that is real. I hear that. And we're seeing an increase in the number of veterinary colleges that are getting accredited which would suggest there must be demand out there. And certainly the American Veterinary Medical Association, so AVMA, has has talked about that. That's one issue. Another issue that's a sort of adjunct to that is costs of veterinary medical education are really increasing. And they are very high. So there may also be some barriers to kids entering the profession because of the debt that could be saddled with. So we have a need. We do see some increase in number of colleges, but we also have a big, big, big discussion in our profession about, again, debt. Couple that with a shortage of veterinary technicians, which I think is really real. And I talk to lots of friends in practice, and many of them say that some of the long waits that people are experiencing, right, when they come to the veterinary clinic have to do with there just aren't enough people there. So your veterinary staff, like the way I used to work, right, techs are doing one thing, veterinarians are doing other things. But when you also have to pull veterinarians to take x-rays, to draw blood, things that I might give to a technician and skitter off to another appointment, right, veterinarians are having to do. And I've heard that from a lot of people, that that adds to the wait times I think a lot of people are experiencing. The next is with COVID restrictions that were different in different places, What some of the AVMA statistics suggest is that the same number of pets were actually being serviced, but it was taking much longer because maybe I had this. I took my dog in for some routine work, which sounds ridiculous because I'm a veterinarian, but I don't don't have a practice anymore. So I take them to a friend of mine, right? I had to stay in the car. That appointment took longer than normal. And so I think these are these problems are really smashing together to create a situation. I, I think it's routine. I hear from people, my neighbors who are like, Kelly, I just had to wait eight hours to go see somebody on emergency. Um, talking to some of my friends, they've had to restaff like some of the big corporate chains that people know about, like VCA. A friend of mine works for them. They had to move veterinarians around from one practice to the other to try to like, oh, they're really busy and maybe somebody's out with COVID. We need to move veterinarians. So I think all of that together is causing a big problem for people trying to get veterinary care right now. Wow. Yeah, uh, it's it really, there's just as you say, there's multi factors involved in this. And, you know, at the end of the day, I just hope and hope and hope that we will find ways for folks to get access to care. Because I also think that folks aren't able to get appointments, maybe at a private practice, maybe they go to a low cost clinic where they can get in, but then that's pushing, you know, another family out in a different way. So there's a ripple effect. So we have to be aware of the various ripple effects that might be impacting our community with regards to overpopulation issues for for cats. Um, Obviously, we are recording this in the summertime. It's now into winter as the show is being released. But, you know, the summer is is a busy time for cats and kittens. And it's also busy spay-neuter time to be able to help keep the population tide stemmed. And many shelters are feeling a lot of pressures. Many uh, shelters are staffed at 75% of their staff or, or less than that. There are lots of open positions in the animal welfare space in addition to the technician and the veterinary side of things, but just general staffing is challenging too. So yeah, we just got to become these like lean, mean, efficient fighting machines where during COVID, everything took two or three times as long. Now we got to figure out how to do it in you know two thirds of the time of what it was before COVID to try and you know play catch up. But anyway... Tell me a little bit, let's move into the Morris Animal Foundation and some of the things that you wanted to chat with us today. So there's what's called the Happy Healthy Cat Campaign. Tell us a little bit about that and and even just give us a bit of a background on the Morris Animal Foundation and and what y'all do. Sure. So Morris Animal Foundation, we are getting ready next year to enter our 75th year. So we've been around a really long time. And we were founded by Mark Morris Sr., who may not be too familiar to people, but you sure know his product, which is Hills Prescription Diets. And so Dr. Morris created the first kidney diet for dogs because he saw a need for it. And then he sold that process to Hills, but very wisely 
took a half a cent a can of sales and started the foundation to fund research focused on animal health, right? Not animals in research, which unfortunately was happening, but really address problems that he said nobody was doing any research really on animal health issues. We started not surprisingly with a dog study, but pretty quickly within a year or two, we had our first cat study. So around 1952, 51, 52, we funded our first cat study and been doing cats ever since. The Happy Healthy Cat campaign was kind of an interesting idea. It's it's over. It ran for a couple years in the mid aughts, but you guys have, it was a great success. And it was really focused on shelter cats, addressing some common problems people saw, but especially a lot of shelter medicine. And one of the things that came from it is those portals you see when you go in and you see those little tunnels, something that simple. That cage design came out of that study because we funded somebody who nobody wanted to fund to look at this. And then the whole idea of like square footage, like how much do cats need, looking at stress and disease outbreaks, which I think everybody takes for granted in the shelter world, but really like how can we minimize that? What strategies that are simple that might be able to deal with that kind of stuff? So that was the Happy Healthy Cat campaign, a gift that keeps giving, I'll tell you, because we see even now some publications that are still coming out of some of that funding that people are are doing a lot about a little bit about cat behavior and optimizing environment, even in your home for cat issues all came out of that campaign. So that was a terrific, I think, focused use of funding several years ago. We also did FIP research initiative a few years ago, and I'm only mentioning it because I think everybody who's listening probably has heard of the black market drug that you can get. And I don't want to say we had a hand in that black market drug as maybe a black market, but we did fund that research that helped with that drug development. Unfortunately, like many things, no pharmaceutical company really wanted it. They may want it now, but this was pre-COVID and it is on the market for, but we funded that development of drug and testing that occurred. If people know Niels Peterson, who's out at University of California, Davis, did a study in the shelter there, right? Treating cats with FIP with this drug. We funded that one too. Again, a really great focused initiative that came a few years after the Happy Healthy CAG campaign. All through this, of course, we have our normal funding cycle where people can come to us pretty much with anything. But we're about to start another initiative. We have a call out right now for proposals looking at non-surgical spay and focused on community cats, free roaming cats. And that's been a big problem, right? For us, a big problem for people to solve. And we had a couple of people as part of the Happy Healthy Cat campaign who looked at some Medicaid, right, injections. And I think, you know, it's it's kind of works, but you got to catch the cats. And, and again, when it went into a trial where they basically threw free roaming cats together, less than optimal, even though initially it looked okay. And we have a new call out there. Things have changed since we were looking at that 10 years, 15 years ago, right? Tech, technology has changed. Our understanding of reproduction has changed. And so we're looking forward. Our, it closes Friday. So I'll be really, really excited that we start the review process to see what we've got. We have two donors. So this is a donor-inspired study. Two donors are funding it. And we're grateful to them. They wish to remain anonymous right now, which is really nice of them. They're people we've known for a long time, and they're really passionate about this topic. Do you have a pet that's naughty or nice? Have you heard about Tevra Pet No-No Correction Spray for cats and dogs? Turn a no-no into a very merry pet. From our family at Tevra Pet to you and your furry pals, happy holidays from Tevra Pet. Ever wanted to quickly connect, collaborate, or problem solve with others in the animal welfare field who are, you know, real people? Look no further than Maddie's Pet Forum. Maddie's Pet Forum brings people of animal welfare together with the common goal to keep more people and pets together. We share ideas, expertise, offer each other support, resources, and more. Visit forum.maddiespetforum.org slash cats. 
Maddie's Pet Forum. Come for an answer. Stay for the community. You know, well, let me ask you a question on that, the non-surgical spay or non-surgical sterilization. We've, you, we've had Joyce Briggs and her crew from ACC and D on talking about some of the work that they've done. Um, and, it, and it does seem like this conversation has been going on for quite a few years here. Why do you feel we're closer to being there for community cats at this point? Yeah, that's a good You know, it kind of comes up and down in waves. I'm hoping that what we've learned about vaccination in general is going to be improved. The other thing is our technology, right? Our genetic ability to create, I don't want to say genetic engineering because that sometimes is a sort of hot button, but that's kind of what it is, right? We're learning more about how do we create a better vaccine? How do we create a safer vaccine? Maybe a vaccine that lasts a long time. But they're also talking like medication. You know, is there a medication, a long acting? I think we know for women, there are some long acting birth control, right? That's new. Can we find a better way? Do we have a better way of delivering this to cats where we don't have to like catch them? Like, how do you do that? And uh, take a look at it. So I'm hoping that especially the molecular biology technology, which has really changed the last 10 years. I think if you've ever had 23andMe, it used to be really expensive to get your genome done. Now it's, what, 100 bucks? You can go get it done. So that has really changed what we even see grant proposals coming in. Like all of a sudden people are looking at new, oh, this technology is now affordable for a veterinary researcher to use, right? Not somebody maybe at the NIH. And how can we use this stuff? So we're really interested to see what people come up with that may be a different approach than what's been done in the past, which is historically focused on, again, trying to figure out a long acting hormonal release product. And as we all know, you have to catch them again sometimes. Oh, it'll work, but you got to catch them every three months. Well, that's not really going to work for us, right? Right. So what, what can we find instead? Yeah. And on top of that, you have identification challenges too, for sure. And, and behavioral, because sometimes even if they are spayed or sterilized there, there is the hormonal issues that can come into play too. And I, I, I don't care if it's spayed, neutered or, or not, you know, an, an in heat behaving animal or an unneutered behaving like animal that even would be neutered, but still is spraying is not a happy cat in the household. Right. So we also have to look at behavior because I do think that once those behaviors are reduced, cats, community cats do have a chance of becoming adopted by the community. As long as they are able to live in a household in a peaceful way, they might have a chance of actually getting a community absorbed home in there. Right, so right. they're, they're so there again, more factors. We're just a day full of factors here. Just more, more factors to, to consider. Another factor to consider when we're talking about cats is cats and birds. And we're talking about cats and birds. And, and there was a, a study that you wanted to, to reference about cats and birds on that topic. Right. And this came from the group at University of Florida, which has been very, very active in this area for a long time and have done just great, great work. And, you know, there are a lot of community cats in Florida. We know that the population, along with ball pythons and all other kinds of things that have gotten out, right? And they're in the environment and there's a tremendous amount of tension with people advocating for birds. And there are a lot of birds, obviously, in Florida too. And a few years ago, the group from University of Florida, they took a little different approach to trying to figure out because they were just like, oh, these two sides and they're fighting and they can't get together is to actually look at ways to bridge that gap. And they interviewed people and talked to them about all the factors that go into community cats. And and what they found, like I think a lot of times we know, is there are common ground. For example, cat people don't really want birds to die. They get that. And the bird people are like, well, I don't really feel good about killing cats. Like when it came right down to it, even if they seemed frustrated or were like, uh, you know, kill the cats, they actually don't. When you sit them down in a room, they don't like that, right? They don't really want to do that because they're animal people. And so again, trying to find ways of structuring and finding common ground and sometimes finding those pieces before you get the stakeholders together in a room so that you can 
bridge that and start it with a framework was really helpful for productive dialogue. And the paper really tried to give some strategies when you have two groups that are really at loggerhead, like throwing them in a room is not really a good idea, (laughs) but maybe doing some prep work and understanding where people are coming from, sharing that, and then getting people in together and guiding the conversation and mediating was much more productive. I wouldn't say they solved the bird cat problem, but their purpose was really to try to say, how do we approach this so we get something out of it instead of a bunch of angry people that nothing happens? So I think the problem that I see with that paper is you know, it's open source, anyone can get it. So you can look at the statistics. And a lot of people have viewed it, but not near as many people have I seen apply it, nor do I hear it referenced a lot. And I think that's unfortunate. The gal who wrote it as a, I think she was a graduate student or postdoc moved on to actually work on another problem, which is wild horses. So she actually came out West to look at the same, can I look at my framework and maybe adjust it because that's a hot, I mean, living here in Colorado, that's a big issue for us. Right. I mean, the conversation isn't just around birds and cats. There's so many other animals too, that the whole ecosystem's getting, you know, one way or the other. So it's, I, I read more and more stories. I was reading about snakes and the Everglades and that's the ball pythons, right? Now, an interesting thing is because cats are crafty, right? The lynx are, I think it's actually the pumas are now learning uh, python eggs are good eaten. So somehow nature, so now that's really intriguing, isn't it? They figured out, so maybe those guys will be our eventual ball python control. But it is, it's a, and it's not just a problem in the United States, right? We see it over all around the world. In fact, we funded a study that was looking at that had like kitty cams, right? Just to look at behavior of cats. One was in Indonesia, same problems. Cats that have become feral. Uh, we've done work in Argentina, in Patagonia, looking at the interface of cats and wild cats. And like our cats, domestic cats giving passing diseases, particularly was FEL, VFIV. So again, like we funded a lot of research that kind of peripherally touches on community cats, maybe not welfare directly, but the good news from that one study and in Argentina was it well, didn't look so bad, which was good for the domestic cats that are roaming around because people are like, I think we should just get rid of them. They're probably spreading disease like wildfire. Well, in that case, they weren't they weren't as bad as people thought, and they didn't ad- interact quite as much as people thought, which was good news. That's not always the case, right? We know that diseases spread, but it also highlights like we need science and research because if we just react in the way that we think is the right way to react, we could be causing more harm than good. That's very true. Very true. You know, a lot of my listeners on the podcast are individuals, they're just trying to help a few cats in their own backyard. You know, what is it that you would advise them? Oh, that's a good question. I think that staying on top of, I mean, we always talk about learning. You got to learn, right? Because I think what I know about cats, having had them all, I'm always learning new stuff. And I think I know a lot because I'm a veterinarian, I've always had cats and I'm always learning. So I think learning and being open, sometimes you have to, like sometimes stuff that I thought was really true is not true. And I sometimes cringe because I'm like, oh boy, I know I told my clients this stuff, right? Especially about behavior. I think we're learning a lot more about feline behavior than we knew before and being open to that. So that's good. I think um, people who take care of cats have their best interest in mind, right? Or you wouldn't do it. And I think just staying aware of what is the latest or the latest recommendations by your shelter. I think a lot of uh, shelters are doing a much better job talking to people. I talked with some people in um, Canada because we funded people in Montreal and they were talking about the kitten problems people see, right? And they're like, actually, you're better leaving the kittens be sometimes, right? Then bring it like, don't bring kittens 
ones or even stray cats, right? Sometimes those cats are owned. So kind of knowing, learning what cats are around, because I think we all know, and my parents had two wonderful cats that everybody in the neighborhood thought they owned because they ended up sleeping at my parents and getting breakfast, but then roamed the whole neighborhood, right? So they were kind of a community cat. They were kind of owned, but it is, I think, tempting to take those, um, to intervene in those cats' lives sometimes in ways that could be harmful for them ultimately. And I, so I would tell people, stay open, learn, like, you know, keep learning because we, we keep learning more. I think supporting your local humane societies and shelters, I think they're resource poor, right? They really need help volunteering, if I could say that to people. I know everybody's busy, but I think volunteering time, especially at a time where we are poorly staffed, would be super helpful. And yeah, that that would be the advice. I don't want to tell you to donate to us. Donate to whoever. But I will say there are si- a lot of science organizations. Again, um, the folks, there's a great uh, shelter program out at UC Davis that is really changing the paradigm on shelter. There are all the folks there at Florida that are doing great, great work that are really focused on shelter medicine. I mean, there are programs out there now, never heard of it when I went through school, that are always looking for support as well. Yeah. And one other thing I would like to mention too, is just that cats are not dogs. And so the way that the community has solved a dog situation is not the same path for a cat. And that's what we have to understand and think about. So when you are caring for some cats in your backyard, you may not be responding to them in the same way as you would if there was a dog or three dogs in your backyard. So just to keep that in mind is that some of our best solutions don't fall in that same structure that we would for dogs and and try and think in a different way. And I just don't think that as a community, we understand what, what's that path for the cat instead you know, we've, we've always been well-trained on the dog. We get the dog licensed. We have the dog goes to the kennel. You, you know, you go reclaim your dog when your dog got off leash or whatever. But here with cats, I think we need to have a new community understanding about how we under, how we work with cats. And it's not in that same path right, that we right. have had with dogs too. Yeah. Get them chipped, right? <laughs> yeah. Like get your cat chipped. Chipped, identified for sure. Definitely. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you have a a friendly cat in your backyard and you want to know if it's owned, use a paper collar, put the paper collar on and say, you know, am I owned? Call me, let me know that somebody owns me or, you know, that kind of thing. So there's just a lot of different outside the box solutions that work best for our, our cats, for sure. Right. Right. Definitely. And I think, you know, even our cats that don't really go outside hardly at all, they've got collars on, they're chipped. So I would tell you, even if you have an indoor cat, because how many times indoor cats do get out and mine are useless outside, like they go, blah, you know, they don't really, uh, so I could see them bolting yeah. or getting nervous and running away. And so, yeah, even if your cat's indoors or you plan to keep them indoors completely, get them chipped. Absolutely. So Kelly, if uh, folks are interested in finding out more about the Morris Animal Foundation, how would they do that? Sure. If you go to our website, which is morrisanimalfoundation.org, so sorry for the long name, but it'll get you there. We have a lot of different information. We have access to blogs that cover a variety of topics. We have a podcast that covers a variety of our, usually we have researchers on. We got some cat ones um, for sure. For If people are interested in all different kinds of cat topics, you can sign up for our newsletters. You can read them online. We have a lot of different resources. We did a remodel of our website a few years ago. So it's a lot nicer to look at and a lot easier to navigate. But I would encourage people to take a peek if they're interested in learning more. Super. We'll we'll put a couple of links to the podcast in the show notes for sure and share that. Um, Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? I think I am really glad to talk to people who are cat focused. And I want everyone to know out there from the veterinary side of it, I see so, so much more information, lots more stuff. Even at my internal medicine meeting, I just came back from that's focused on cats specifically and cat medicine. And I feel like as a group, 
we are recognizing they are, I mean, we don't even say that all, right? They're, they're not small dogs. Veterinarians now are finally getting that message and research is really, really focused on the specific needs of cats, whether it's their mental well-being and sociability, as well as their health issues. And I'm optimistic we're going to make some more progress in that area because we still lag behind dogs a little bit, but we'll get there. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Kelly, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on my show and I hope we'll have you on again in the future. I would love to be on again, Stacey. This was so much fun talking to all you cat people out there and I would be wearing my ears if I didn't have my headphones on, but it was just so much fun. And I appreciate all the work that people are doing out there to keep our kitties that are outside safe. Thank you all everybody for turning your passion for cats into action. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think, and a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats. The holidays will be very merry and bright for your pet with pet care products from TevraPet.com. Every pet deserves to be healthy. At TevraPet, we keep pets well from nose to tail. Happy holidays from everyone at TevraPet. Pet.